It's time to get your news on. We are VK1 WIA. And many of us are getting the news on this week on our brand new rigs. The rigs we all bought Monday, Cyber Monday. OK, I'm Graham, VK4BB, and this week, WIA Secretary Peter Clee, VK8ZZ, and Editor-in-Chief of WIA Amateur Radio Magazine, Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH, plus, of course, much, much more in this edition of news from the Wireless Institute of Australia. Thanks, Graham, and good morning, listeners. This is Peter Clee, VK8ZZ. The World Radio Conference are held every three to four years to review and, if necessary, revise the radio regulations. That is, the International Treaty Governing the Use of Radio Frequency Spectrum and the Geostationary Satellite and Non-Geostationary Satellite Orbits. One of the outcomes of previous WRCs was the introduction of the 10, 18 and 24 megahertz bands, better known as the WARC bands. In the WRC 2015, it developed a consensus around the new 15 kilohertz wide global secondary 60 metre amateur allocation of 5351.5 to 5366.5 kilohertz. This allocation is yet, however, to be adopted in Australia by the ACMA. WRC 19 concluded with several international agreements, including International Mobile Telecommunications or 5G, the Global Maritime Distress and Safety System, and communications over wireless access systems, including local radio area networks or Wi-Fi. The WRC 23 is currently being held from the 20th of November to the 15th of December in Dubai. Australia is represented at the World Radio Conference by the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communications and the Arts. As the peak national body for amateur radio in Australia, the Wireless Institute of Australia have sent two members of in the Australian delegation to represent amateur radio on behalf of all Australian amateurs. Our representatives are Dale Hughes, VK1DSH, and Peter Picorni, VK2EMR. WRC23 has an agenda item at 9.1 on the future of the 23cm band. This band intersects and overlaps with the Radio Navigation Satellite Service in the lead-up to WRC23. The Working Party 5A was unable to come to a consensus recommendation for this issue because of some hard resistance from several states. So the final decisions on this item will be up to debate inside of the WRC23. The president of the International Amateur Radio Union, Tim Ellum, was interviewed and that link is available in the text version. So we anxiously await reports from our delegates and ultimately the outcomes of this World Radio Conference. This is Peter Clee, VK8ZZ, a WIA Director and Secretary. This is Editor-in-Chief of Amateur Radio Magazine, Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH. I believe issue 6 has begun to circulate in letterboxes and newsagents, much to the chagrin of the clickerati inhabiting social media, apparently. While attending the Gold Coast Amateur Radio Society's annual ham fest here the other week, I was accosted by a fellow ham, as often happens at ham fests, who revealed that he rather liked issue 5. But before I could ask him why, he said, How do you do it? How do you keep turning them out? I replied as I generally do. It's a team effort. The Publications Committee, the Production Graphics Guy and I all working together. And so that became the theme of my editorial in Issue 6. Turning to the centre pages, once again, Issue 6 this year carries the 2024 contest calendar, which Alan VK 4SN compiles and produces each year and posts on his website. Being the centre pages, you can lift them out and stick the calendar to the wall on your shack, on the fridge door or wherever it takes your fancy. Lou VK 3AQZ continues detailing his three-band HF rig for the road. Justin VK 7TW provides a maker's viewpoint of his short vertical for the 160 metre band. Don VK6JDM explains how to make 
open wire ladder line from low cost agricultural parts. For something more celestial, Kevin VK4UH explains the joys of meteor scatter propagation. Newcomer's Notebook this issue covers the matter of forward, reflected and standing waves. Speaking of which, on page 5, board member Giles VK5GK offers some worthy reflections. Naturally, it's time for the 2024 rules for the Ross Hole Memorial VHF contest. There's more besides. Just let me pop this in here. Why not take a turn to put VK90AR to air? Instructions are on the WIA website online event calendar. So, Amateur Radio Magazine, Volume 91, Issue Number 6, All Guts, No Gab, serving Australian hams for 90 years, proudly produced and printed in Australia. Also available online, working together with the webmaster. Always published to a schedule, never random. I'm Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH, for VK1WIA News. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1WIA. Now with international news, Jason, VK2LAW. Hello, some news relating to WRC23. Discussions on 40 to 50 MHz radar sounders continues with some progress. After merging various proposals, multiple satellite-borne radars with 10 dB gain Yagi antennas would be free to transmit over polar regions at any time of day, not just at 3 a.m., with restricted operation outside the defined areas unless agreed by the countries concerned. IARU is particularly concerned that these have wideband transmissions and will cause an issue in the adjacent 50 MHz weak signal DX segment. For technical reasons, the radars don't fully turn off, so there's a complex set of power flux density limits in and outside of polar regions and in the adjacent 50 to 54 MHz band that are yet to be decided. Using radio waves to diagnose climate issues. We ask the question, can radio waves help diagnose climate issues? A team of researchers says yes. The atmosphere has a message for us, and it's possible that we may be able to receive it thanks to the 6G networks of the future. The next generation form of telecommunications is already being eyed for cellular development, but it's in the range from 100 gigahertz into the terahertz frequencies and positions it for another unintended use. According to an amateur radio newsline report, read an article in the IEEE Spectrum. Waves utilised by 6G are easily absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. As such, scientists may be able to use the radio waves to discern what kind of atmospheric gases are present, especially the kind that imperil the well-being of the planet and those of us who live on it. Boston researcher Josep Jornet suggests that because different molecules absorb electromagnetic radiation differently, scientists can employ 6G transmissions in much the same way spectroscopy was used to identify which molecules were present and what their concentration is. Yorda, in fact, calls it over-the-air spectroscopy. Although 6G networks are not ready for prime time, the study's authors believe a dual-purpose 6G network of the future could have immense benefits. To news from Region 1, hams throughout IARU Region 1 have set aside a day to celebrate radio's growing accessibility for persons with disabilities, and that day has now arrived. United Nations has declared the 3rd of December to be the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. This is the day to recognise and celebrate the accessibility that amateur radio provides to everyone, either through special equipment designed to be used by hams with various disabilities or recognising nets organised by disabled amateurs. Activities on this day celebrate the inclusion that radio offers despite many individuals' personal challenges. The Region 1 coordinator Riri, Oscar Delta 5 Romeo India, has said many member societies will be getting on the air with special call signs. There'll also be other on-air events to raise awareness of the ongoing need for ham radio to be an inclusive community. Individual operators and member societies will be honoured for their participation. 
Bahrain Amateur Radio Society is but one station QRV with the special event station Alpha 91 India Delta Papa Delta for the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Riri said the activities support the global program's sustainable development goals, which include the removal of inequality. To news from Region 3, Shimla is the capital of the northern Indian state of Himachal Pradesh in the Himalayan foothills. And in a bid to promote amateur rodeo as an effective tool for alternate communication during emergencies, the Himachal Pradesh government has announced a subsidy of up to 60,000 Indian rupees for basic equipment to all persons who have passed the licensing examination to be ham radio operators. That's around 1,000 Australian dollars. A wireless communication network through amateur radio is one of the most effective and alternative means of communication. The skills of a trained amateur radio operator can be used for public service in times of need and emergency, said Chief Minister Sukhavinda Singh Sukhu in a statement issued here on Sunday. Now to weird and wonderful. Last week, I told you of the MacGyver-type umbrella antenna. This week, a little antenna with a lot of can-do. What can you do with a can of ham? Well, you can make a sandwich for one thing, or you can make contact on a local repeater. John Williams, VK4JJW, explains. Viewers of his YouTube channel, Ham Radio Rookie, now know that Ben Eady, VE6SFX, has become a man with a can and a plan. The can once contained ham, and the plan for the can was grand. Ben first ate the ham, washed the can, and got to his plan. He turned it into an antenna. That's right, an antenna. It was Ben's latest experiment on his channel's new feature called Will It Ham? The seven-minute video shows him attaching a PVC pipe, adding a few 3D printed pieces to the assembly, and putting a jumper on it to turn it into a slot antenna. After finding a likely feed point, he checks it with a nano VNA and declares it beautifully resonant on 70 centimetres and ready for a radio check on a local repeater with the help of a friend. He tells his friend, I'm talking to you via a can of ham, and the good signal report that comes back is clearly no baloney. His friend asks, would the antenna be as resonant if the ham was still inside? Oh, that's a question Ben could surely sink his teeth into. This is John Williams, VK4JJW. Meanwhile, he tells YouTube viewers that he's in search of other possible projects that are too absurd for anyone else to do. What's in his future? Maybe he'll turn a tin of tuna into a tuna. For VK1 WIA National News, in Sydney, I'm Jason, VK2LAW. Now, operational news with Felix, VK4FUQ. Hello there. AWRL 10 Meter Contest. The AWRL 10 Meter Contest is on the air from 0000 hours UTC on Saturday 9 December until 2359 hours UTC on Sunday 10 December using CW and SSB and operating for a maximum of 36 hours out of the 48 hour period. Off times must be at least 30 minutes long. All stations exchange a signal report, while US, Canadian and Mexican stations send their state or province. DX stations send a serial number, and maritime mobile stations send ITU region 1 to 3. Your log must be uploaded within 7 days after the contest. Now contest wise 2024. Ross Hill Memorial Contest running on VHF and above for the month of January. January 2024, VHF, UHF Summer Field Day, 13, 14 January. Australia Day Contest. It is held on the Australia Day Public Holiday, 26th of January. Some VK operators will be using the AX prefix to celebrate Australia Day. New Zealand's Dog White Memorial Field Day will be 24, 25 February 2024. Trans Tasman Lobin Contest. July 21, 2024 August 17, 18, 2024 Remembrance Day Contest This contest commemorates the Australian amateurs who died during World War II. Again, the 2024 contest is 17 and 18 August. DX Window, December VI-10 BKFF running all year celebrates the 10-year anniversary of the BKFF group. VK-90AR for Amateur Radio Magazine 
The WIA will be running the VK90 AI activity until December 31. Special event station VI100MB celebrates the centenary of the Mani Warringah Radio Society. France. Activate special call sign tm 125 ed through to the 31st of December, marking the 125th anniversary of a public demonstration by Radio Pioneer, Eugène Deschelles, of wireless communication between the Eiffel Tower, Paris, and the Pantheon in Rome. All CW and SSB QSOs will be confirmed automatically via the Bureau and EQSL. Switzerland. HB8 DELOY is the special call sign for members of the Swiss Air Force Museum's Radio Club commemorating the 100th anniversary of the first transatlantic amateur two way contact between Leon Deloy, F8 AB, and Fred Schnell. 1 MO which took place on 20th November 1923. Look for activity until the 31st of December. QSL via HB9 ACA. Bureau preferred. Taiwan. BM0 QSO until December 31 using mostly digital modes. QSL via BM2 JCC. Luxembourg. LX90 RTL is in use to celebrate the 90th anniversary of Radio Luxembourg's first long wave broadcast. For more information, see qrz.com. India. Special event station AT30 IIH is QRV until December 31 to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Indian Institute of Hams. His focus is to train and bring young people into our amateur radio community. Norway. LA100K is the special call sign in use by the oldest amateur radio club in Norway until the 31st of December. Namibia. QRV is V51WH from Oromoru until the end of April 2024. Activities on 160 to 10 metres, including 60 metres for those in the world able to use that band. V51WH. QSL to Gunter. Home call is DK2WH. For BK1WIA National News, I'm Felix, BK4FUQ, Inningham. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1WIA. Now, special interest group news with Bruce, vk 3 F. And a very good day to you. Worldwide Special Interest Groups Digital. The VK2 RPM Ratnet DMR Repeater is now on air from Middle Brother Mountain. It's providing excellent DMR mobile and handheld radio coverage in the large area between Port Macquarie and Taree. There is now almost continuous DMR coverage along the Pacific Highway from south of Kempsey to south of Sydney. The VK2 RPM DMR repeater has filled in the gap that previously existed between the coverage areas of the VK2 RCN DMR repeater at Telegraph Point and the Great Lakes VK2 RGL DMR repeater. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Final Frontier. Happy 10th birthday, FunCube 1. November 21st, 2023 marked the 10th anniversary of our very first CubeSat mission, FunCube 1. A very short time after the launch from Russia, and within a few minutes from deployment, the very first frame of data from the low-power transmitter on board was detected and decoded by ZS1LS in South Africa. He relayed the data over the internet from his dashboard to the data warehouse, and the numbers appeared as if by magic at the launch party being held at the RSGB National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park. After a brief checkout, the FunCube team were able to switch the transmitter to full power again at the very first attempt and were quite amazed at the strength of the signal from the 300 milliwatt transmitter on 145.935 MHz. The transponder was then switched on, the first contact between G6LVB and M5AKA. The team finished the day with a request to AMSAT NA for an Oscar number and were delighted to receive the AO73 Oscar 73 designation. 
Since then, FunCube 1 has operated with in excess of 53,500 orbits, 1.3 billion miles travelled, 61 million telemetry data packets transmitted, and with more than 10.9 million unique data packets downloaded and stored in the data warehouse. Worldwide Special Interest Groups Military The FCC has issued a waiver to allow US ham radio operators to communicate with federal stations on and around Pearl Harbor Day. The American Radio Relay League requested the limited four-day waiver from the Mobility Division of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. The Commission explained the waiver request is for the limited purpose of a short-term event relating to National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, commemorating the 82nd anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack and to allow amateur licensees to practice communication techniques with the United States military from December 6th to 9th, 2023. The waiver is conditional on participating stations monitoring the three identified federal frequencies of 14.375 MHz, 18.1625 MHz and 21.856 MHz. Responding on spectrum allocated to the amateur service and only at the request of event organisers, operating consistent with the privileges of their amateur licences, and limiting communications to the period December 6th to 9th. The annual commemoration remembers the 2,403 service members and civilians killed during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbour on December 7th, 1941. Another 1,178 people were injured in the attack, which permanently sank two US Navy battleships and destroyed 188 aircraft. In 1994, Congress designated December 7th as National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Radio Amateur Old Timers, and it's to Clive, VK6 CSW. Reminding you that tomorrow is the first Monday of the month, time for the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia's December Bulletin to go to air. This month, as well as the latest club news, I'll be relating a recent story about some pitfalls when hiring a Tesla EV. This will be followed by an AI-generated discussion on the history of the transistor and its early development. Everyone, REOTC members and non-members alike, is most welcome to listen to the program and to join in the callbacks afterwards. Full details of all transmission times and modes can be found on the RAOTC website at www.raotc.org.au or just Google RAOTC Broadcasts. If none of the transmission times suit you, you can download the audio file at any time from today from the club website. The next lunchtime meeting for members and friends of the RAOTC in Perth at the Woodbridge Hotel, East Guildford, will be on Tuesday, December the 12th. All are welcome. Full details are published on the club website. There will be no broadcast in January as per usual. However, we will return on the first Monday in February. Once again, tune in tomorrow for the December REOTC Bulletin. Enjoy the program and please join in the callbacks afterwards. 7-3 from Clive, VK6, CSW. Thanks, Clive. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Radio Amateur Young Timers, IOTA. And now to Alec, VK2, APC. Thank you, Bruce. December Yoda Month from IARU Region 1. A reminder to all listeners that December is once again Youngsters on the Air Yoda Month. This is a busy time of year, especially for we young ham radio operators across the world. This December, many Yoda teams will light up the bands in the interest of giving even more youngsters a taste of our great hobby. A full list of participating stations can be found on the website in the text and video editions of this week's WIA National News. For the entire month, several youngsters will become active with Yoda as the callsign suffix. The idea for this is to show the amateur radio hobby to the youth and to encourage youngsters to be active on the radio waves. Therefore, if you happen to hear a Yoda station active on the bands over the month of December, please take a few minutes to give them a call as it's a great way to help promote the service to the next generation of DXs, contesters, and rag chewers. 
One such Yoda call is from the SARL, the special events call sign ZS9 Yoda. With a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, for almost 307,000 AUD and private donations of more than $30,000, the University of Scranton Amateur Radio Club in Pennsylvania has installed new amateur radio equipment and antennas for its station, W3USR. The station uh, features the -the state-of-the-art operating positions with heavy-duty controllers, all-mode transceivers, speakers, desktop microphones, and other components. A 40-foot tower with a high-frequency antenna for 14, 21, and 28 MHz has been installed, as well as VHF and UHF satellite and microwave antennas. The impact of the new station means everything to the club. When you can bring a group of students into a new facility like this one, the impact makes a lasting impression that will allow them to fully experience amateur radio. An additional room near the amateur radio shack holds equipment and antennas connections and will be used as a lab for controlled ham site space research projects. I'm Alec, VK2 APC in Sydney. And thanks, Alec. Worldwide Special Interest Groups Rescue Radio. This was in news courtesy of VK2WI. Dementia Australia has started to advertise its memory walk and jog events for 2024 and Wyson will be providing communications for these events all over VK2, VK1 and beyond. So there will be opportunities for members outside of Sydney to participate. These are great starter events for new or even rusty Wyson members as they take only a couple of hours. Wyson also provides the radios for these events so you don't even need to bring your own gear. Why not give one a go? You'll find a link to the events list in the text edition of this week's WIA National News. And imagine being missing from your family for 24 years. An alert amateur radio operator in India was able to end one man's long absence from home by simply keeping his eyes open, asking questions, and yes, using his radio. It was not an amateur radio contact, but a visit to a tea vendor at a bus station that led Hams in West Bengal to bring a former military engineer and his family together after the man went missing 24 years ago. The family had last seen him when he was 44 years old and his son was 15. According to news reports, the father disappeared while en route home to Uttar Pradesh from a military camp in Assam, where he had been posted with the military's engineering services department. According to a report on the Statesman website, the family was so certain that he had died in 2006 that they held a funeral ritual for him. His son, Raj Kumar, told local news media that in spite of that, he and his two sisters never gave up hopes that they would see their father again. The man's wife, however, died a year and a half ago as the search for him continued. The secretary of the West Bengal Club, Ambrash Nar Biswar, VU2JFA, told the statesman that he had spotted a man repeatedly during his frequent visits to a tea vendor at a bus station during the past few months. He began inquiring about the elderly man, who apparently had only limited information about his family and their whereabouts. The ham shared with his own club what little information he could gather about the man's connections to Uttar Pradesh. West Bengal Hams contacted Hams in Uttar Pradesh and they located the man's remaining family members. As Newsline went to production, the Hams were working with local authorities to have the man return home. This is Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. Thanks, Jim. I'm Bruce, VK3 Triple F from sunny Benico. 2024 social scene and clubs are welcome to submit text with audio for this section. Details of all WIA affiliated clubs and WIA affiliated societies can be found on the WIA website wia.org.au and that site includes email addresses and website links. VK3 Barg Hamfest happens Feb 4. It's next door to the Barg Club Rooms at the Ballarat Airport. Happens at 10 a.m. For the whole of VK, it's the WIA AGM, May 4 to 5 in Bundaberg. And National Volunteer Week. That happens Monday the 20th to Sunday the 26th of May. National Volunteer Week is Australia's largest annual celebration of volunteers and their important contribution to our communities. Now till next we meet, I'm Graham, VK4BB. 
Walk softly. This has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5, BD's ATV and YouTube channel, this has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like. Greetings, listeners. This is VK3 OTN, the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia, with this month's news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club for December 2023. I am Andrew, a VK3 Charlie Alpha Hotel. Details on when to hear the news and information bulletins are available at the club's website, www.raotc.org.au. VK3OTN is available on a wide range of radio platforms, HF, VHF and UHF, along with two-metre repeaters, amateur television, DMR, that is digital mobile radio, and D-Star. These news broadcasts are available for download for up to six months, just in case you missed the original news broadcast from the RAOTC website. Just put RAOTC into your favourite search engine. If you'd like to contact the club, then why not send us an email? Our address is raotc at raotc.org.au. I hope you enjoy this month's news broadcast. Welcome to the December 2023 edition of RAOTC Club News. There are a few items this month and we start an update on OTN from Jim, VK3ZKK. The RAOTC has set up an editorial board consisting of two copy editors who edit the submitted articles, a desktop publisher who lays up the articles and inserts photos and diagrams, and two proofreaders. Hopefully members will submit enough articles for us to keep the editorial panel busy. The desktop publisher is using a program called Scribus, which is freeware. This saves paying an annual fee for commercial software. It also means that future desktop publishers will be able to download the publishing software for free. Templates for OTN have been produced which will make future transitions of desktop publisher easier and quicker. Currently the desktop publisher has five articles that have been submitted by members and he has written two additional articles himself. One of his articles is over 15 pages long. So far he has 42 pages for the March 2024 issue. A couple of reports are yet to be written. The size of OTN has to be increased by four pages at a time, so two or three new articles are required each time the number of pages is increased. Please write an article for OTN. We are always looking for articles and how our members got interested in wireless, their amateur radio and electronics activities and how their amateur radio experiences helped them in their working careers. Talk to your radio friends and ask them to write an article or two. The articles do not have to be about radio or electronics. Some of the most popular articles that have been published in OTN have not been radio related. We are very keen to get articles to publish in OTN. The RAOTC webpage has a guide that provides good information about writing articles for OTN. We now have the team to process and publish articles. What we need is the articles. Melbourne Luncheon held on September 28 at the Caulfield RSL. The most recent luncheon was attended by 42 members and guests who enjoyed an excellent two-course luncheon. The guest speaker was Peter Wolfenden of EK3 RV who presented a talk and PowerPoint presentation about the leading lights and bright sparks of the Melbourne City power supplies. This talk was recorded as a video by Mike Ampt of EK3 Charlie Hotel. 
and is available on YouTube for those members who were unable to attend or simply want to watch it again. A link to this video is available on the ROTC website on the page entitled Lunch and Speech Recordings. Not to be outdone this time around, everyone got two for the price of one. That is, there were two presentations. Following on from Peter's excellent presentation, which lasted over an hour, was a presentation by two RAOTC members, WIA Secretary and Director Peter Klee of VK8ZZ and WIA Vice President and Director Lee Moyle, VK3GK. Many members will realise and appreciate the tireless work they put in as directors on the WA board. They gave us a short presentation of the progress of planning for the upcoming ITU conference as well as an update of the transition to a class licence. This presentation was also recorded by Mike, VK3CH, and is also available as a YouTube video. Once again, a link to this video is also available on the ROTC website. I had seen Peter several times before via Zoom teleconference on and off over the last couple of years at ROTC committee meetings, but this was the first time in person. The weather in Melbourne that day was especially nice as opposed to gateway to the South Pole type weather, and I explained to Peter that the weather here in Melbourne is like this all the time. Somehow, I don't think he quite believes me. RAOTC at the Rosebud Radio Fest. The RAOTC was represented at the most recent ham fest held at Rosebud on the Mornington Peninsula, southeast of Melbourne, on November 12. Several hundred amateurs attended the annual Rosebud Radio Fest held each November, with attendants coming from all over Melbourne and also regional areas. Whilst many ham fests are often little more than a trash and treasure event, Rosebud sets itself apart from others by offering catering, outdoor displays and technical forums. This recipe allows many to get something out of the event, even if they have no intention to buy anything, and a great opportunity to catch up with others, similarly in line with the Melbourne and Perth luncheons. Our Administrative Officer, Jim, VK3ZKK, along with his wife Judy, VK3JAG, manned the table, kindly donated by the hosting Southern Peninsula Amateur Radio Club, at no cost to us. This allowed Jim and Judy to showcase RAOTC to the wider amateur community, with two more members joining. I was also due to attend Rosebud, however, a hospital procedure got in the way, an unexpected surprise, and prevented me from taking part of this event. These unexpected surprises in life lead me on to the next subject, which was covered some time back. Planning ahead, disposal of deceased radio amateurs equipment. This is an item put together by Ian Godsell, a VK3JS, at the request of the ROTC committee, and is something all radio old-timers should think about. Till death do us part is usually associated with marriage amongst older people. A similar sentiment probably exists among amateur radio operators as regards our equipment. We all know operators who never get rid of anything, and those who upgrade regularly as well as adding to their shacks when a new interest comes along. All of this is fine and helps the sale of new equipment. However, time passes and we eventually get to a point where we think about retiring and possibly start to run into health difficulties, which for some may lead to a lessening of on-air activity and interest in the hobby of amateur radio. This is normal enough, but sadly, the next step is often overlooked and that is making arrangements for our final illness and eventual death. For many of us, a family member has been asked to look after our affairs. But the question arises, have we fully briefed this loved one on all our wishes? Have we even thought of our amateur radio gear amongst who gets our possessions? If we have not, then we run the risk of a relation suddenly being confronted with a room full of that stuff and having no idea what to do with it. Particularly if we have a large tower and a beam antenna in the back garden. Are you in this category? Even if you are still in good health and quite active in the hobby, 
have you wondered what to do with your rigs if you get sick or what will happen to your beloved equipment in the event of your death if this is you then it is suggested that you stop for a moment and consider these questions you can read the rest of this very interesting article on the ROTC website with a link on the main menu new members today I am pleased to welcome the following new members to RAOTC Barry Kemp Victor Kilo 3 Alpha X-Ray Kilo Wal Wallace Victor Kilo 4 Charlie Bravo Whiskey Trevor Armstrong Victor Kilo 3 Echo Hotel Chris Long Victor Kilo 3 Alpha Mike Lima Rob Meaden Victor Kilo 4 Alpha Delta Uniform and finally Lionel Bird Victor Kilo 7 Zulu Lima Bravo Silent Keys for the first time since I commenced compiling these news and information bulletins I haven't received any reports of silent keys in the last two months Members are reminded that the very latest news is available via the ROTC website. Put ROTC into your favourite search engine to find it. www.roatc.org.au The ROTC committee would like to wish every one of you all the best for the upcoming holiday season and Christmas break, with the next broadcast due to take place on Monday the 5th of February 2024. And that's all the club news we have for you this month. You are listening to VK3 OTN and associated relay stations. VK3 OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club Australia Incorporated with the monthly news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club. This month we have several interesting technical articles for you. First up is Clive, VK6CSW, who relates to a story originally heard on the ABC regarding hiring a new Tesla electric car and some of the pitfalls to look out for. This will be followed by an article I put together for the most recent September 2023 OTN and it's presented by one of my guest speakers. I split the article into two parts, with the remaining second part on the next broadcast. This is in order to keep the broadcast to around 30 minutes in length. Now, it's over to you, Clive. Norman Hermunt is the ABC's Social Affairs Correspondent. On the 16th of September, 2023, he published the following article in the ABC News. It's entitled, I rented a Tesla for a month. It was a steep learning curve. Norman writes, My wife and I decided to rent a Tesla on a visit to Canada last month. A major car rental company was renting them out for about one third the cost of a petrol car. We figured, how different could it be? Turns out, a lot different. It's not a car, it's an operating system with wheels. The anxiety over our car choice started to build six weeks before our trip. An email from the rental company popped into my inbox. Introducing your Tesla Model Y. Two weeks later, another message arrived. Are you ready to experience the rental revolution? This was followed by another email. It's time to explore the world of EV. We read the emails looked at EV electric vehicle charging options and when we picked up the Tesla in downtown Toronto we thought we were ready. First of all, everything about the Tesla Model Y is different from a regular car. Door handles? Yep, these are a two-step process. Push the back part in, the front part pops out and pull to open. Cool? Yes. Needlessly complicated? Also, yes. Virtually all of the controls for the car are on a big iPad-like screen, and I mean nearly everything. Before driving it for the first time, I wanted to adjust the mirrors. Now, in just about every car I've ever driven, there are switches to adjust the mirrors on the door by the driver's side mirror. Not the Tesla. You have to go through the screen, 
find mirrors, choose left and right, and use this ball toggle thingy on the steering wheel to make adjustments. Pretty much everything defaults to the screen. For example, in the default setting for when you reverse, the mirrors tilt to the ground so you can't use them to back up. That's to force you to use the image from the rear camera on the screen. We also use the screen to change our acceleration setting after our first floor it test on the road. After being thrown back into our seats, we figured out how to select the chill setting. That's really what it's called, chill. Even then, it was by far the fastest car I've ever driven. When you're driving, there's nothing directly in front of you to show how fast you're going or if your turn indicators are on. Instead, that's displayed on the top corner of the control screen, just to your right in North America or your left in Australia. In fact, aside from the big screen, the dash has nothing on it at all. I can only surmise this is some sort of tech bro design aesthetic. So clean, it reveals nothing about operating the car. Teslas don't have combustion engines, so there's nothing under the bonnet. Instead, there's a storage space called the frunk, or front trunk. We couldn't get it open for two days. On the third day, after consulting a YouTube video, we figured out we were pushing the wrong part of the control screen to open it. And we never did get the glove box open. It needed a pin. To remove the code in the settings, you needed another pin, which we didn't have. YouTube also provided the location of the hazards lights button. Not on the dash like a regular car, on the roof, of course. The thing is, Driving and charging this car was not a problem. Tesla has a series of superchargers along the big highways in the province of Ontario. On average, it took about 45 minutes to charge up the battery to about 450 kilometers range. Tesla billed this automatically to the rental car company, so that part was brilliant. But for the driver of a low-tech, nine-year-old manual hatchback in Australia, the things this Tesla decided to do on its own were maddening. It has an automatic emergency braking as a default setting. If it determines a car turning across traffic in front of you is too close, it brakes on its own. The car just takes over. You can disable this, but again you have to go into the settings. A few days in, the screen started bugging me to schedule a software update. I kept putting it off, but the car wore me down. A message came up and said once the update starts, we couldn't use the car for 25 minutes. Hardly the end of the world, but is this thing a car or a laptop? Every time we got in, the screen asked us to authorize data sharing. Every time we killed that box, we figured Elon Musk and Tesla can get along fine without our data. And how do the many people that own Teslas feel about all of this? Well, it seems from a quick glance online that they have fully bought in. Drivers post videos such as 20 hidden Tesla tips and hidden features and Tesla Model 3Y tips and tricks. I'm all for the EV revolution, but I guess I'm old school. No tricks, no updates, no automatic control. I just want to drive the car. Thanks very much, Clive. You are listening to VK3 OTN. VK3 OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club Australia Incorporated with the monthly news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club. The history of the transistor and its early developments. A transistor is a semiconductor device with at least three terminals for connection to an electric circuit. In the common case, the third terminal controls the flow of current between the other two terminals. This can be used for amplification, as in the case of a radio receiver, or for rapid switching, as in the case of digital circuits. The transistor replaced the vacuum tube triode, also called a thermionic valve, which was much larger in size and used significantly more power to operate. 
The first transistor was successfully demonstrated on December 23, 1947, at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Bell Labs was the research arm of American Telephone and Telegraph. The three individuals credited with the invention of the transistor were William Shockley, John Bardeen and Walter Brittain. The introduction of the transistor is often considered one of the most important inventions in history. Transistors are broadly classified into two categories, bipolar junction transistors and field effect transistors. The principle of a field effect transistor was proposed by Julius Edgar Lilienfeld in 1925. John Bardeen, Walter Brittain and William Shockley invented the first working transistors at Bell Labs, the point contact transistor, in 1947. Shockley introduced the improved bipolar junction transistor in 1948, which entered production in the early 1950s and led to the first widespread use of transistors. The MOSFET, also known as the MOS transistor, was invented by Mohammed Atullah and Daywan Khan at Bell Labs in 1959. MOSFETs use even less power, which led to the mass production of MOS transistors for a wide range of uses. The MOSFET has since become the most widely manufactured device in history. Origins of Transistor Concept The first patent for the field effect transistor principle was filed in Canada by Austrian-Hungarian physicist Julius Edgar Lilienfeld on October 22, 1925, but Lilienfeld published no research articles about his devices and his work was ignored by industry. In 1934 German physicist Dr. Oskar Heil patented another field effect transistor. There is no direct evidence that these devices were built, but later work in the 1990s show that one of Lilienfeld's designs worked as described and gave substantial gain. Legal papers from the Bell Labs patent show that William Shockley and a co-worker at Bell Labs, Gerald Pearson, had built operational versions from Lilienfeld's patents, yet they never referenced this work in any of their later research papers or historical articles. The Bell Labs work on the transistor emerged from wartime efforts to produce extremely pure germanium crystal mixer diodes, used in radar units as a frequency mixer element in microwave radar receivers. UK researchers had produced models using a tungsten filament on a germanium disc, but these were difficult to manufacture and not particularly robust. Bell's version was a single crystal design that was both smaller and completely solid. A parallel project on germanium diodes at Purdue University succeeded in producing the good quality germanium semiconducting crystals that were used at Bell Labs. Early tube-based circuits did not switch fast enough for this role, leading the Bell team to use solid-state diodes instead. After the war, Shockley decided to attempt the building of a triode-like semiconductor device. He secured funding and lab space and went to work on the problem with Bardeen and Brittain. John Bardeen eventually developed a new branch of quantum mechanics known as surface physics to account for the odd behavior they saw, and Bardeen and Walter Brittain eventually succeeded in building a working device. The key to the development of the transistor was the further understanding of the process of the electron mobility in a semiconductor. It was realized that if there was some way to control the flow of the electrons from the emitter to the collector of this newly discovered diode, discovered 1874, patented 1906, one could build an amplifier. For instance, if one placed contacts on either side of a single type of crystal, the current would not flow through it. However, if a third contact could then inject electrons or holes into the material, the current would flow. Actually doing this appeared to be very difficult. If the crystal were of any reasonable size, the number of electrons or holes required to be injected would have to be very large, making it less useful as an amplifier because it would require a large injection current to start with. That said, the whole idea of the crystal diode was that the crystal itself could provide the electrons over a very small distance, the depletion region. The key appeared to be to place the input and output contacts very close together on the surface of the crystal on either side of this region. 
Bretain started working on building such a device and tantalizing hints of amplification continued to appear as the team worked on the problem. And that's where we leave the history of the transistor for this month, returning for the final part on the next broadcast. OTN on disk. Are you aware that the entire collection of OTN is available on disk, delivered right to your door for the minimal cost of $25? The files are all in a portable document format or PDF and can be viewed on any tablet or desktop PC. As time moves on, you've probably noticed that over the years you tend to hoard a few things. When something new arrives home, you have to find room to keep it. Well, why not consider adding the entire collection of OTN? The really good news is, it won't take up any space at all, and it won't provide any food for the silverfish, if you're plagued by them. There is another advantage that might not be quite so evident. The files are pretty much the same as what goes off to the printer twice a year. As time moves on, many readers realise their eyes aren't as young as they used to be. Viewing articles on a 22 inch screen is a whole lot easier. You can zoom right in and have one whole column on the screen at a time. Like online newspapers, it's not quite the same as a printed copy, but the advantage is you don't have to worry about where you're going to keep the things. Further details of how to order OTN on disk is available from the RAOTC website www raotc.org.au This is Andrew, VK3CAH Perth Luncheons The popular and well-attended monthly luncheons for RAOTC members and friends in and around the Perth area are held on the second Tuesday of each month. The VK6 RAOTC group have a new venue, the Woodbridge Hotel, 50 East Street, East Guildford. Reports indicate the hospitality to be excellent. The Perth group meet at 11.30am for lunch at 12 midday. This is not a buffet meal, but excellent food in both pensioner and standard portions are available. We would like to place the orders at 12 midday, so please don't be late. This information is courtesy of Phil, VK6ZKO, whose contact details can be found on the club website. You are listening to VK3 OTN and Associated Relay Stations. VK3 OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club, Australia Incorporated, with a monthly news and information bulletin for members and friends of the club. In keeping with tradition, we conclude this broadcast with a short, humorous story. This one's entitled, The Drover. A drover from a huge cattle station in Outback Australia appeared before St Peter at the Pearly Gates. Have you done anything of particular merit? St Peter asked. Well, I can think of one thing the drover offered. Once on a trip to the back blocks of Broken Hill out in New South Wales, I came across a gang of bikers who were threatening a young Sheila. I told them to leave her alone, but they wouldn't listen. So I approached the largest, meanest and most heavily tattooed bikey and smacked him in the face, kicked his bike over, ripped out his nose ring and threw it on the ground. I yelled, now back off or I'll kick you so hard your eyeballs will pop out of their sockets. St Peter was impressed. Goodness me, that was brave. When did this happen? A couple of minutes ago. <laughs> That's all we have for you this month and we hope you found something of interest. Thanks for being with us and we hope you will join in the callbacks where callbacks are taken. The next RAOTC news and information broadcast will take place on the first Monday of February. Monday the 5th, 2024 on the same frequencies and the same times as today. If you have missed all or part of this broadcast or you just want to listen to it again it is available for download from the RAOTC website. Simply go to www.raotc.org.au Again the website URL is www.raotc.org.au 
reotc.org.au. On the right hand side is the main menu. Click on a VK3 OTN broadcast and you will be able to see the various times and frequencies of the VK3 OTN transmissions by all of our volunteers, provided of course a volunteer is available. Down towards the bottom of the page is the current and previous five broadcasts for you to listen to. Sometimes a relay station is an automated broadcast, for example a repeater, where no operator is available to take callbacks. Other times the volunteer operator suffers from very heavy local QRM and callbacks are not always possible. Many operators need a small amount of time to switch from playing a recorded file to using a microphone. Please be mindful of this. This is VK3 OTN signing clear from today's news and information broadcast. 73 and all the best for the new year from the REOTC broadcast team.